water today is on dehumidification, removing moisture from air. As a reminder, heating air is not dehumidification. Our example, if we take air at 50 degrees dry bulb, 75% relative humidity, and we heat it up to 100 degrees, yes, in fact, the relative humidity does go down. But take a look at the absolute conditions of moisture, the ratio, grains of moisture per pound of dry air, the dew point, and the vapor pressure, every one of the absolute measurements of moisture stays exactly the same. So in other words, we are not changing the amount of moisture. It has not changed. We have not removed it. So heating air is not dehumidification. Looking at it this way on our psychometric chart, if we start at a condition of 60 degrees, a relatively high so like about 80% relative humidity. We heat that air up to 120 degrees in this example. We have not moved down on the chart. We have not removed any moisture. We have merely moved horizontally. Yes, the relative humidity lines we've cut through. Yes, the relative humidity does become less, but we do not remove moisture. Now, we do heat air and use warm air to dry things. Uh, once we heat the air, that bucket of air, if you will, uh, becomes larger. Therefore, the amount of moisture in it as a percentage is less. It leaves more room in the bucket for more moisture to go. So through evaporation, we can take a wetted surface and evaporate that moisture into that now more empty, if you want to think of it that way, bucket of air. So yes, we do use hot air for drying, but heating the air in and of itself does not remove the moisture. We're going to look at two ways of dehumidifying today. The first is to cool that air. We're going to cool it to the point of condensing the moisture out of the air. And we're going to use the words mechanical dehumidification or mechanical DH around that. Why? Because cooling the air requires compressors, condensers, fans, those kinds of mechanical devices. So we will call that mechanical dehumidification. The second way that we'll spend most of our time on then is removing the moisture with desiccants. We will use a material called a desiccant material to adsorb, to remove the moisture out of the air. So two ways. The first is then the cooling. And we would also maybe attach the word latent to this cooling. Uh, back to our psychometric chart, we're showing you a point here that is consistent with a warm, wet, outside air condition. Over 100 degrees, looks like about 150 grains of moisture per pound of dry air. So if we start at this point one and we start to cool that air, as we come and approach and get to the point of 100% relative humidity, the dew starts to drop out or we start to condense, we start to take moisture out and follow down as close as we can to the 100% relative humidity line until we get to a point where that coil can no longer be cool enough, the surface isn't cool enough to get any more uh, cooler of, of an air, to transfer any more uh, heat. Uh, so in this case, we're coming down to 45 degrees uh, at this point. So from a moisture standpoint, check this out. We started at 150 grains. We brought that down to about 40 grains. So again, a dew point of 45 degrees using chill water or DX or ammonia or something. That coil having a temperature less than the air we're getting to. And if we were to assume a 10 degree approach on that coil, that would mean we could potentially get down as low as, let's say, 42 degrees using a 10 degree approach, 32 degrees on the coil, because if we go lower than that 32 degrees, danger, 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 we will start making ice. But let's also talk about the energy required. If we were to condense moisture out of the air, that act of condensing, condensation, requires 1,060, count them, 1,060 BTUs per hour to remove or condense a pound of water out of the air. 
Now there's extra energy to make that happen, again, for those motors, for those compressors, for those pumps, whatever it might be. And rule of thumb at 45 degree suction or 45 degree chill water, it's about 50% more energy. In other words, if I take this 1060, I need to apply about 1500 BTUs or use up about 1500 BTUs to apply this 1060. Now, as we drop in temperature down to, let's say this 30 degree mark, why 30? Well, you know, we can frost a coil a little bit at 30 degrees, depends on how you pick the coil and so on and so forth, but that, that's about as low as we can go. Now, in that case, we're gonna use about twice as much energy that it takes to condense the moisture out or 100% extra energy, if you will, for that mechanical system. All right, so from an energy standpoint, we're gonna start at 1,060 BTUs, uh, it could use somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000, and remember the issue of ice. Uh, so, removing moisture, cooling, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 BTUs for a pound. Well, these things called desiccants, they start at around 2,000 BTUs per pound. Mechanical dehumidification, its limit, practical limit then, is when we get to that icing condition normally. Let's now look at active desiccant. We'll start to familiarize you with this system. The drawing before you in the lower left hand corner, we are showing an airstream coming in at 35 grains, 45 degrees. This might be consistent with a food processing facility or maybe a film archival storage or something. Air comes in, you can see it has a lot of moisture in it. It goes through the rotor, it leaves the moisture, and then it comes out the other side at less moisture. This one about six grains, which is about a one degree dew point. There is a second airstream that we take, we heat that air up, we take the moisture out of the wheel, and then eject that back to atmosphere. That is called reactivation, regeneration. We'll look at that a little bit more in detail. But think of that as the conveyor belt with buckets on it that we want to take those buckets and put water in those buckets so that we can get that out of the system. So there are two air streams that we're dealing with. One is the one we're drying, the other where we're ejecting that moisture. Rule of thumb is if you are going to control a room, control a room at 45 degree dew point or higher, if that's where we're going to control the room, 45 dew, dew, dew point or higher, we will look at refrigeration. It can handle the load. It's probably the most energy efficient. But below that point, any room that we're trying to control below a 45 degree dew point, we really need to consider desiccants. They are probably more energy efficient overall and as well can get a larger grain depression. They can give you a larger safety factor or they can do more work, however you'd like to look at that. The process of desiccant dehumidification looks like this on the psychometric chart. This is showing a pre-cooled condition to 55 degrees. The desiccant roughly follows down the enthalpy line, but it does kick out to the right a little bit because of the added heat from the mass of the rotor. We'll talk about that in some more detail. But it looks generally like this, following out and kicking out to the right of the enthalpy line. This is how we manufacture desiccant media. On the left-hand side, you'll see a photo of a ceramic fiber. Now, this looks like a roll of paper, if you will. It's not paper, it's not cellulose, it's a ceramic or fiberglass fiber. But if you hold it in your hands and lift it up to the light, you can sort of see through it. We take that material and we either wind it or lay it in flat sheets, but it's a corrugated sheet and then a flat sheet. A corrugated sheet and then a flat sheet. Corrugated sheet and then a flat sheet. Uh, again, either wound or in a block style. Once we have that structure, then we take the silica gel desiccant and we synthesize it around the fiber. So that when we are done, 80% of the weight of the rotor, of this desiccant rotor, 80% of the weight of the 
is desiccant material. So we've maximized the desiccant material and we've tried to minimize the other 20%, that's the ceramic fiber, that which holds it together. So we're maximizing the amount of desiccants. Vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the force that we are going to use to move moisture in and out of the desiccant material. That is the significant force, vapor pressure, and the difference of it that makes the desiccant function. Now remember, vapor pressure always moves from high to low. If you want to remember that, take a bucket of water, throw it up into the air, and it's going to go from high to low. Of course, that's gravity, not vapor pressure, but you get the idea. Here's an example of vapor pressure. We have a building right here in sunny southern Minnesota, green grass, green leaves. And on the outside of this building, we have a condition of 94 degrees and 135 grains. At that condition, we have about 0.9 inches, 0.9 inches of HG, that's mercury, 0.9 inches of mercury vapor pressure. Vapor pressure being that partial pressure of the moisture in air. So that pressure is pushing on this building. It's trying to get that moisture in the building because in the building we're showing in one room 75 degrees, 50 percent relative humidity, a kind of a normal office building if you will. That equates to a 65 grain and a little less than half of that outdoor condition, 0.438, is the vapor pressure. And then let's say we have a room also in this building that we are going to hold at 62 degrees and 50 percent RH. That would be similar to what we do for a hospital surgical suite. 62 degrees, 50 percent RH, that's 41 grains at about a quarter of an inch. So in this room, a quarter inch of pressure, this other room, 0.438 inches. If we open a door, even if we have air pressure, we have a pressurized space trying to push air from one space to the other, this vapor pressure being a much more significant force in terms of water column pressure, we'll have something in the neighborhood of about a two inch water column differential pushing that moisture into the air on the other side to the point where it would at some point equalize. Uh, now that I mentioned earlier is if we open a door, but you don't have to have an open door. It could just be a cement wall or a wall that has permeability or permeance to it so that the moisture can push right through the wall. Walls that do not allow permeation would be things like glass or steel. In some cases we do that just to hold down on the amount of moisture that would transfer. So in this example you can see the very significant force of moisture trying to push that water around. Another quick example, if we had 70 degree air at 30 percent relative humidity, here's our psych chart, 70 degrees, follow it up to 30 percent relative humidity, off to the right we see it's about a quarter of an inch of mercury pressure. Same 70 degrees, but now at 50% relative humidity, off to the right, about 0.37 inches. The differential, the difference between the two, about 0.15 inches of mercury. That's approximately one inch of water column vapor pressure differential that's going to make that water want to move from spot to spot. Well, it's that vapor pressure differential that we're going to use to make water move in and out of the desiccant. That vapor is adsorbed into that desiccant, that crystalline structure, that pore is empty when we start this process. So we have a desiccant pore which is empty. If it's empty, it then has a lower vapor pressure than the air around it. That air with the water vapor in it then moves past the desiccant. The water vapor is then, because it again has a higher vapor pressure, is going to be pushed into or propelled into that desiccant opening, that crystalline structure, again by that vapor pressure differential. So that incoming air uh, through what we're going to call the process part of this rotor, incoming air goes through that process sector and then 
goes out the other side drier than it when it entered. That dry air then leaves that part of the rotor at an approximate 30 to 40 grain depression. Rule of thumb. Now, I'm going to start introducing some rules of thumb. We'll qualify what those are based on later. But rule of thumb, 30 to 40 grains of depression. Here we have Mickey Mouse, H2O. Uh, because Mickey is in the airstream, we have a higher pressure. If this desiccant pore is empty, it has a lower pressure, and so that water molecule is going to go into that desiccant pore, and it's going to stay there until something happens. Well, what happens? Uh, we want to make a continuous process so we can keep this rotor dry, so it can keep working, and so we are continuously then have a second airstream which we reactivate or regenerate the desiccant. We dry out the wheel, if you will. It is normally 100% outside air. We normally rule of thumb that that reactivation entering air is heated somewhere between 250 and 284 degrees. Now, why do we heat that air? Well, some days that air is cool, wet, and rainy. It could be 60 degrees and raining outside, so if that's my bucket of air, I'm full of water already. So by heating the air, by heating it up, we make that bucket bigger, has the same amount of water in it, but now the bucket is bigger. So it can hold some water. So we heat the air, number one, to have a place for the moisture to go it is going to reduce the relative humidity. But the second reason we heat the air is because we also want to increase the temperature of the desiccant particle. And when we do, that's when desorption occurs. Desorption happens when you supply enough energy to the water molecule that it's going to begin to shake and vibrate and break or loose its bond from holding it into that desiccant surface. So once it does, because the water vapor is now at a lower condition in the other airstream, it is going to transfer out of the desiccant into that low relative humidity reactivation airstream. So it's going to come out of the desiccant into this airstream. That then wet, humid air is going to be rejected to the ambient away from the controlled environment. So it's a continuous process of adding moisture to the rotor and taking moisture out of the rotor, taking it out of the system, taking it out of the room or whatever you're trying to control. We start in the lower left-hand corner. We have this air that has a lot of moisture in it. It goes through the rotor. It comes out with a little bit of moisture, much less moisture. The second airstream starts, we heat it up, we take the moisture out of the system. It's a continuous process and the way we have a continuous process then is we turn that rotor, rotor through one airstream to the other. It spins, if you will, but at a very slow rate, 16 revolutions per hour. That takes about five minutes for one revolution. So that rotor then is inside a cassette it's inside of a structure that has seals on it to seal it off so one airstream goes one direction, the other is isolated going the other direction. So we put that inside then, this dehumidifier casing or air handling unit casing. The air that we're trying to dry comes through some sort of a MERV-8 pre-filter, a minimum of a MERV-8 pre-filter, goes through the rotor again, is dried out and then pumped to whatever process we're going to. The reactivation airstream, it's a tunnel inside of the air handler. We heat that air up. This one is showing a direct gas fired heater. There's a diffuser to blend the air so that we get the consistent temperature across that surface, across the desiccant, and then it's ejected to atmosphere. So that desiccant wheel inside a cassette, inside the air handler, two different airstreams. So the phases that we're going through, looking at the face of the rotor. Let's take the first phase, the sorption phase, the sector number one, three quarters of the rotor. Let's say that that air is going into your screen. It is isolated from the second airstream, and you can see the stainless steel member this direction, crossed horizontally it's isolated using a very good contact seal. 
So the two air streams are isolated. Section one is where we wet the rotor, if you will, or adsorb the moisture. It's the sorption part of the rotor, which is taking on moisture. It turning slowly. It crosses over then into sector two. Sector two is where we desorb the moisture. We're taking it out of the rotor. So that airstream then would be coming the other direction and opposing direction, and the moisture comes out of the wheel. So that is where the wheel has been warmed or heated. As that wheel then turns across this seal sector, this horizontal seal sector, and it turns into the airstream that we are dehumidifying, that wheel is still hot, it's still warm. And so that sector cannot do any work because it's hot. And what we first need to do is cool that sector. This is an infrared photo of that. At the top of the page will be the seal. We've just turned out of reactivation, and you can see there's about five, six, seven degrees rule of thumb of this rotor that's too warm to take on any moisture. As it is presented to the airstream, as the air is moving through it, it's turning slowly, and you can see it gets to about this point where now it can start taking on moisture. So the rotor is adding some heat and it's not doing any work in this sector. So that could be called the inefficiency, if you will, of the desiccant system. Now that size of that sector, rule of thumb is like the one on the right, about five, six, seven degrees. But in some cases, when we're trying to get down to like that minus 100 dew point, very, very dry air. In a 100 degree dew point application, the sector needed for cooling the rotor becomes quite large. So we actually use that sector then to preheat the air for reactivation. So it's a very e efficient way to use an inefficient system, if you will. Anyway, that's what happens on a very low dew point application. Most of our applications look like the one on the right, where it's about a five to six degree portion of the sector. But there are still some purges that we can apply. We use the term purge to help us retain that energy. Just to uh, help you understand this, in the lower left-hand corner again is where the air comes in. We go through a filter, we go through the rotor, come out the other side. So this one quarter portion of it is the outside air coming in, get it he getting heated up, taking the moisture and ejecting it out. This little rectangle here is trying to show you the hot sector of the rotor. So what we can do is we can take outside air, pass it across that sector, which effectively cools it. It cannot take in any, on any moisture, so we're not filling the rotor up with moisture. But that heated air then, we're going to turn back around and use that in the reactivation airstream. So it cools the rotor and it heats up the air. So we get to count that same energy twice, if you will, in the system. So that is one type of purge. There are other purges that we can apply, but the use of them is to help with the efficiency of the system. Now, looking again at the uh, psychometrics of this, if we uh, start at this pre-cool condition, again, we're at 50 degrees, if the desiccant had no mass, if it didn't weigh anything, we would simply follow the enthalpy line down. Rule of thumb we talked earlier, if you start over here, looks like about 50 grains. Uh, you would come down, rule of thumb, 30 to 40 grains. So that's about here, follow back up. If it had no mass, it would follow the enthalpy line. But it does have mass, and so rule of thumb, if you take a look at this dry bulb condition, this one's coming out at 75 degrees, and add 15% to that 75 degrees, or about 86 degrees, is where you would come off of that rotor, about 86. So it kicks off to the right a little bit. Uh, this is a computer-generated selection data uh, for one of our products. This one at 5,000 CFM. This one selected for 50 degrees, 53 grains. That air goes through, comes out the other side at 14 grains, so about a 40 grain depression. That air goes through at 800 feet per minute, has a 1.4 inch air pressure drop. In this case, we're taking out 124 pounds of water 
in an hour, and we're using about 1,560 BTUs per pound to do that. So a pretty efficient system in terms of energy, 1,560 BTUs per pound. The other airstream, the reactivation air, uh, starts at this outside air condition. We heat it up to 284 degrees, come out the other side, 135 degrees, 288 grains. That's wet, 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 wet. So a lot of moisture in that air. That's why the reactivation portion of our system is, is all stainless steel. If this is a ducted indoor system, you want to make sure to uh, drain that moisture out of the ductwork. Most of our systems are rooftop, so you don't have to worry about that. But there's a lot of moisture in that duct. Put both parts of the process on one chart. You'll see the process inlet, as we mentioned earlier, a little bit of extra heat coming out to the right. The reactivation airstream, 100% outside air, heated up. See the quite low relative humidity at that point. Looks like it's below 5% relative humidity. That airstream then going through, taking the moisture on and a little bit of uh, sensible cooling as well and falls away from the enthalpy line. Now, this line, the reactivation, and this line, the process, are equal amounts of energy. They're equal amounts of energy. It has to have a energy balance. So why is one line three times longer than the other? One line three times longer. Well, that's because it is one-third, rule of thumb, one-third of the flow. So the process flow, or that which we're trying to dry out, let's say that is 9,000 CFM, then the reactivation airstream would be 3,000 CFM. So a rule of thumb, about one-third of the process air is what you need for reactivation. These units must operate in equilibrium. We just said that earlier. The process side has to balance the energy on the reactivation side. But this process is dynamic, meaning the wheel is turning, the outside air maybe has different conditions coming in, the return air, maybe some outside air blend, that air that we're trying to dry possibly has different conditions. And as we have a requirement in the room that goes up or down, maybe we need drier air, less dry air. My point is that there's things going on that will go up and down on both sides of the equation. So we need to make sure that that system operates in equilibrium because if it doesn't, if the system is not in equilibrium, which can occur if that, that airflow and temperatures are not controlled, then the dehumidifier is not going to perform in a predictable manner. In other words, it's going to hunt and peck and try to find what's going on. So we need to design the control system to address that. And, and that's what we've done at CDI. The reactivation energy does need to modulate. So as the load on the process side drops, less energy is going to be required to maintain the same outlet condition. So we need to take that reactivation energy input and modulate it to maintain a consistent reactivation outlet temperature to make sure that wheel is dry, if you will. So that reactivation input temperature, we're going to monitor it and then protect the rotor from overheat damage. This is what a control diagram might look like. Again, the air we're drying starts in the lower left-hand corner, goes through the rotor, comes out the other side dry. But the reactivation air, that's the air that we're controlling the temperature of. That outside air comes in, showing it getting heated with a direct gas-fired burner. Uh, comes through the rotor, at this point it's that rule of thumb, 250 to 284 degrees, comes through, takes on the moisture, temperature goes down. We try to control that again to somewhere around 130 degree leaving air temperature. That way we know the rotor is dry. But let's say the load drops, so there's less moisture in the rotor, so as there's less moisture in the rotor and it turns into this airstream, there's less work that we need to do. And so this condition will want to go up in temperature. We sense that, we say back down on the uh, gas burner, do use less energy. There's other things that can happen too, like this filter can get clogged or dirty. The flow goes down, and for any given energy input, the temperature will want to rise, but we have a uh, override inlet condition uh, applied so that we do not harm 
uh, the rotor. But uh, in any case, that's all taken care of for you in this uh, PLC controller. As I mentioned earlier, it's back net or whatever you'd like to talk to it. Very easy to do. You know, when you have a cooling coil, you get to do a lot of things to pick that coil. You get to pick the chill water temperature or the temperature of the, the fluid. You get to work with the velocity of air, how many rows, how many fins, a uh, number of things that you can work with to choose your capacity. Well, as far as desiccants are concerned, these are the factors that affect the performance. The, the first is the inlet moisture condition. It's basically how much moisture is coming in in the first place. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we decide whether we're using pre-cooling coils or not. But how much inlet moisture is coming in? The next one is that inlet temperature. The warmer the temperature, the less efficient the rotor is, if you will. The cooler the temperature, the more efficient it is. There's a bigger differential for the moisture to come and go. Process velocity, how fast is the air that goes through it? The reactivation input energy, how warm we're getting that air will determine performance as well. And then the amount of desiccant that we present to the airstream. We've been talking about some rules of thumb. Well, they're based on presenting this much desiccant to the airstream, a 200 millimeter thick rotor, which is eight inches a process to reactivation ratio of 75-25. We said, you know, it's a three to one when we're looking at that rotor. That is the rule of thumb. That's the normal desiccant configuration day in and day out. If we need to do less work though, we could go to a four inch thick rotor. If we do need to do more work, we can go to a 16 inch thick rotor. We can also change the rotor speed. So how much desiccant is presented to the airstream is one of the primary ways that we determine capacity. We also said that reactivation inlet energy is a way to control it. Let's take a look at this chart. and Let's start with, again, where those rules of thumb came from. We said it was 200 millimeter thick. That's what that says. Three to one process, 800 feet per minute, outside air. On the left-hand side of the chart, we see the grains of depression. So how much are we depressing that moisture from the inlet to the outlet? The colored lines are the various conditions of uh, the air coming into the rotor. The red line with the red dot, 95 degrees, 98 grains, all the way down to the blue line, uh, 50 degrees, 49 grains. So those are different temperature and moisture conditions of the moisture coming into the rotor. We said our rule of thumb was based on that reactivation inlet temperature of somewhere between 250 and 284 degrees. So when we heat that reactivation up to that zone, we use a air across of it, or when the air across the rotor is of these conditions, we get that 30 to 40 grains of depression. So that's where those rules of thumb came from, 30, 40 grains of depression based on the three to one process, 200 th millimeter thick and so on. Now notice this, as that temperature is, becomes less, the amount of moisture removed becomes less. So we can, if you have low temperature waste heat from something, from a chiller or solar hot water or something, look how much moisture removal we can still do, you know, from a few grains up to as high as maybe 20 grains of moisture removal with low grade heat. So remember uh, waste heat when you're looking at using desiccants for moisture removal. That leads us then into how we modulate the work that we're doing, humidity modulation. The first method is to use the room itself as a shock absorber for on-off unit operation. So this would be something like a ice arena where the space is relatively large and the moisture amount is, is, is a small compared to the relative size of the, of the room. And so the room itself becomes a shock absorber for on-off injection of this dry air. This also would be true of some sort of a storage facility. So on-off unit operation, very common.
The second most common is the use of face and bypass dampers. Desiccant is dumb, so if that air goes across the desiccant, the desiccant's want, going to want to take the moisture out of it. So we use face and bypass dampers. I'll show you a drawing of that shortly. The third way then is reactivation heat modulation, and that was described by the chart we looked at earlier, and we'll look at it again. And then the last way, process flow modulation. Now this method is, is somewhat rare. We use this on applications where we have a very high air volume and a very low latent load. This would be similar to a data center. So you've got 100,000, 200,000 CFM of air, which is sensible only cooling. They've got a little bit of latent load because the outside air dampers are leaking or something like that. And so we take one of these small dehumidifiers, 1,000 CFM, 2,000 CFM, and we put that in a parallel flow, and then we uh, control how much work it does by how much air goes through it. The most common way of modulating the condition, again, is face and bypass dampers. Uh, it is controllable plus or minus 1% of our target point. So that air comes into the machine. If we want to dry the air, it goes through the rotor. If we do not need to dry the air, it goes around the rotor. So any blend in between, and we can get to a condition plus or minus 1% of what you're trying to accomplish. So face and bypass dampers, uh, one of the more common ways to do it. Another way to control capacity is to control the reactivation temperature. This system is plus or minus 5% of the control point, plus or minus 5% of the control point. So it's not quite as accurate. Works well for some applications that uh, aren't as uh, picky, if you will, but it's a uh, lower cost is primarily why uh, people do it. So capacity control through reactivation inlet conditions, plus or minus 5% of control point has a lower first cost. And so basically, if we want to do less moisture removal, uh, we move the temperature of the reactivation down in, to meet that capacity. So capacity control from inlet reactivation temperature. Let's move on and talk about when we need to pre-cool. We have been talking about the desiccant dehumidifier removing moisture. At the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about cooling coils removing moisture. When do you want to use which one? Well, we're controlling below that 45 degree dew point, you're going to want to use the desiccant. However, depending on how much outside air you're bringing into the system, might mean that you want to include also a pre-cooling coil or a first stage of moisture removal. Rule of thumb is that if you have 20% outside air or less, that you can bring that air, that mixed air condition, right into the rotor. Because if I started here with this mixed air condition and applied that through a desiccant rotor, I'd get somewhere out in this zone. So I'd be getting into the lower grain levels where we most likely want to get to if we're trying to dry or dehumidify. Contrasting that, if we took 100% outside air and brought that right into the desiccant rotor, look where we'd be. We'd be out here somewhere, way up in the you know, 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and we wouldn't have removed very much moisture yet. Let me uh, erase this for you. Yeah, so we wouldn't have removed very much moisture yet. So if we're 100% outside air, we definitely want to precondition it and most often that's with a cooling coil. We bring it down into somewhere down into this zone, 60 degrees, 55 degrees, something like that. Now our mixed air would be you know, somewhere in this zone, and so if we go through the desiccant, we're gonna to get to where we want to. So 100% outside air, going to want to pre-cool. You could also use some type of enthalpy heat recovery and accomplish potentially the same thing. Now let's take a kind of a different condition. We said 20% outside air, go right into the desiccant. 100% outside air, pre-cool first. What about something that's up to 50% outside air? Two ways to do that. One is to mix the air and then cool it. The other is to just take that 50% outside air and cool it and then blend it back with the other. And that tends to have a much more efficient way to do it. 
So really kind of three ways to take a look at preconditioning. Number one, if it's below 20% outside air, right into the desiccant. Number two, 100% outside air, going to want to precondition. Three, somewhere around 50% outside air, just precondition that smaller outside air stream, then blend them together. So that's when we pre-cool. How about post-cool? Well, there are some applications, some spaces that like the warm temperature. So for instance, ice arenas. If we're discharging air at 85, 90 degrees into that ice arena, those parents wa watching their children skate around appreciate that. They're gonna be sensibly heating that space anyway. So in that situation, or potentially like a wastewater treatment plant where it's a corrosion application, and by heating the air, we're also reducing the relative humidity, relative humidity being the culprit why corrosion happens. So those are potentially two applications where we would not post-cool. But there's a number of other applications where that is just too warm of temperature, we need to post-cool. Well, you can add a post-cooling coil to remove that excess heat. It could be included right in the CDI unit or not. For instance, like the chilled beam application, because this is a sensible only post-cooling device, sensible, we're not doing any latent cooling. This is sensible only. The chilled beam in the ceiling can do that sensible cooling or some sort of a post-cooling evaporator in a room can do the cooling. It's sensible only. We're not gonna make any water. We're not gonna make any ice. So you can post-cool however you might desire. Well, your CDI units come in all flavors. They come from 500 CFM. We catalog them all the way up to 47,000 CFM. We package them in a custom air handling situation up into the hundreds of thousands of CFM. They can include and always do include the controls for reactivation, but can include or you may supply the controls for controlling the system if you wish and a multitude of, of different options that you can have with that product. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is Tom Peterson giving you salutations from uh, sunny southern Minnesota. Please enjoy the day.